murder started, she was under attack this morning. When she is able to comprehend, I need you all to let her know that I said that she's going to remain under attack. There's a heavy cost for the oil that's on her life. And she's going to remain under attack because the enemy knows the bridge that she is from that group of people that the church normally can't touch yes, that's right. that love her, respect her, and honor her and the enemy does not want her influence over them so you're going to remain under attack but tell somebody the good news is there is not one weapon the enemy is forming that's going to be possible You get stronger from serving while you're attacked. It's just like the gym. You get stronger by pushing heavier weight. The heavier weight that you push, the stronger you're going to get. And so you can't sit down. You can't take a season off. You can't. You cannot. Because the enemy knows. He, he knows. He, here's the thing about the enemy. He thinks he knows more than what God knows. God knows how close you are to quitting. God knows how close you are to walking away. And the enemy does too. Yeah. But this is why God always, do you notice that whenever you're attacked, it's always when you're around other believers that can build you up? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there is a heavy oil in your life that's going to transcend the four walls of this church. That's going to transcend the city limits of Desert Hot Springs. There's an oil, you've been peculiar for a long time. You never fit in really. You never fit in, really. You thought people liked you, and that's because they really just tolerated you. Yeah. And so it broke you because you thought that the people that really loved you, you found out they only tolerated you. And it broke you like you've never been broken before. And God said, I am loud that to be exposed to you so you can truly see that you would never fit in in the first place. And so you can't quit. You can't throw in the towel because you really have nothing to go back to. Y'all remember the children of Israel when Pharaoh said, get them up out of here? He said, they just got to go. It's almost like the enemy's camp said, get her up out of here. She got, you have nothing to go back to. Can y'all point your hands towards Minister David Barrett, please? This way. Minister Barrett, God has not forgotten about you. As a matter of fact, while you were worshiping, God told me to let you know that this coming season, people are going to wish they treated you better than the last season. This coming season, people are going to wish that they treated you better over the last two, three, four, five years. And it has nothing to do with, with tangible things. They're just going to start to really recognize the grace that's on your life. This is what's going to happen. I prophesied to him about a year ago, and I said that there were people who he poured into who are now touring musicians, and they're, they're signing with major labels, and they walked away without even giving him credit, giving him any glory. Y'all remember how Joseph helped the people out of jail, and they never gave, okay. And I said, and I said, God says he sees the hurt, but this will be the year where things turn around to the point where they're going to start just dropping your name just in circles, and people are going to start to ask, who is this day? The Lord told me to tell you that your name is in rooms that you've never walked in yet, but it's already there. To the point where when you walk in, they're going to already know who you are based on who's talking about you. Y'all don't understand. Y'all don't understand. Y'all don't understand who this man is musically in the kingdom. But sometimes God allows situations to humble us and keep us focused. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? But make no mistake about it, because he's in the corner of California in a small city called Desert Hot Springs, does not negate the fact that he has a great oil on his life. This will be the season that people will wish they treated you better. Y'all, just mark, just mark my words. Just mark my words. These big name musicians that you poured into, they're going to start dropping your name in random conversations to the point where you're almost going to become a godfather of the industry. Okay. I'm excited. 
excited for him because I work with him musically. So now I'm really excited for him. God said he's going to become almost a God godfather figure in the music industry. I saw something the other day. It was your son, Myron. Your wife shared his video. And his video was a song that he wrote. It was a beautiful song I was watching. I watched it seven times because that was how beautiful it was. And do you know, I mean, his son is, their, their son, he's an amazing musician. But in all of his chord changes, I heard Pops. I heard Pops in everything that he did. Now, you may have to be a musician to kind of pick up what I'm putting down, but from playing sax next to this man, I know his chord progression. I heard Pops in everything. So God sent the, 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 the recognition that even your son has is going to pale in comparison to what I'm going to do for you this season. Now, this is just me talking as your bishop. I honor your humility. I honor your faithfulness. I draw strength from you from week to week because I know the pressures of, I, just, just trust me, I know. But God is saying you've been faithful over the small things. I'm about to make you rumor over many. Just, just hold on. Elder Bear, just hold on. Things about to change quickly. Now, 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 here's the, here's the caveat. When he blow up, he can't leave us. No, I'm you're not going to be time. <laughs> Listen, um, the spirit of the Lord is in this place on today. Amen. I, you know it's something when 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 Sunday morning doesn't go as rehearsal went. I wasn't at rehearsal, but I could just tell this wasn't what I could just tell. But I could just tell. And yet still the Lord says, I see you confusion. I'm gonna raise you some oil on today. <laughs> By the time they got to thank you, Lord, we was already slain in this place. <laughs> I just know that God is up to something very peculiar. I know he's up to something very strange. And I had to do some research last night. And do you know that on U.S. soil, whenever something crazy happened, pandemic, epidemic, terrorist attack, there always followed a revival. Yeah. I'm talking, I started back in 1918 with the Spanish flu and moved all the way up to 2020. Yes. And from the Spanish flu to the Oklahoma City bombing, to the Ebola epidemic, to the swine flu epidemic, to 9-11 and everything else in between, after this happened on US soil, revival came right after that. If you are a lover of souls, you should be excited because God is about to do some major things in the kingdom on the heels. Our children can be released. I'm sorry. If y'all go to children, y'all go ahead because I know I'll just jump right in. On the heels of what's happening, there is about to be breakthrough in the kingdom. And so I'm excited on this morning because I saw a glimpse. And I, speak, I, I spoke with Minister Jackson last night. And we were talking about revival. And I walked in here this morning and I felt revival in the building. Brother Leon, correct? He was sitting in the second pew back there, first time here. And this is about 9.30 when I walked out. And the Lord told us, when after I talked to you, the Lord said that I'm going to start sending people to the houses of worship. I'm going to start sending them to the houses of worship because they are now hearing my voice. They're hearing my call. I walked in this morning and my brother was sitting right there. He came to Sunday school because he said that somebody who fixes water here left an invitation to the church. And I know who that somebody was. Sister Ida, well, can you wave your hand, Sister Ida? That's her husband that, that left the water. <laughs> and Brother Tim, he's not minister to him, sorry, he's not here with us today. But, but God said, I'm sending revival to the church. And God said, when revival gets to the church, I need to make sure that the church knows how to handle revival. You can ask for more money all you want to. But if you can't budget a hundred, you're surely not going to be able to budget a million. Yeah, more money won't fix the problems. Discipline will fix the problems. Are y'all with me? Right, right, okay, all right. And I know I used to be there. If I could just have a little bit more money, and God said, you throw that away too, because you don't know how to manage money right now. And so God is saying, when the increase comes this time, I want to make sure the church is disciplined. You all remember the story where, where, where they went fishing. 
And the Bible says they were fishing all day. And Jesus said, have you caught anything? They said, no, we haven't caught anything. He says, well, cast your net on the other side. And the Bible says they cast their net on the other side. And they got so much fish that their nets began to break. It wasn't the fact that there was no fish in the lake. It was, a, it was probably the issue that Jesus knew they didn't have what it took to hold on to the fish in the first place. So God is saying, I'm sending a revival. Church, can I revive you first? We've gotten some things wrong. We've gotten a lot right. But this pandemic has shown errors in the, in the church and the structure that we know. Showing us how far as a church, as the body of Christ, that we've gotten from the word in itself. This pandemic in this last political season has shown us how many of us are following ideas as opposed to following Jesus himself. And so when I see people arguing over which political party is more like Jesus, I laugh and then I immediately get upset. Because at the end of the day, we're not following doctrines of politicians. We're following the word of God. Are y'all with me? Are y'all with me? Now, you can vote for whoever you want to vote for, but I'm sorry, Joe Biden is not my Lord and Savior. That belongs to Jesus Christ, okay? All right, y'all with me? Okay, y'all with me, right? Okay. So, so Paul, so Paul, Paul is... And, I, and I, was, I was looking at this scripture. I think I was speaking with Elder Franklin and, and Minister uh, Tommy about this scripture a few weeks ago. I've been looking at this scripture for about four weeks. And, 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 and it really jumps out to me because Paul is really speaking to the church as to where we are right now. We are on the brink of revival. But with revival comes an enhanced attack by the enemy. You have to understand before you get excited about revival, understand that with revival comes persecution. <sighs> okay. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, everybody wants revival, but with revival comes persecution. So we have to be ready for that, right? So we can't be excited to jump into something without fully understanding what comes with it. And 1 Corinthians 16 and 13, Paul says, Be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. Paul is writing to this Corinthian church. He's letting them know that I'm coming to visit you. And I'm coming to visit you because there's a great opportunity that's about to happen in your city. The Church of Corinth was a blended city. It was, it was, it was, it was like Desert Hot Springs. It was people from everywhere. You know, and if you look at it in 2021, uh, a, a scope of, of, of where we are right now, you had black, white, Hispanic, you had foreigners, you had natives, you had people from everywhere. You had Jews, you had Christians, you had people that believed in Greek gods and, and, uh, and, and all these deists. And then you had, and then you had, um, and then you had these different um, uh, upbringing structures and all. They're all in one city at the one time. And so Paul says that's a great opportunity. He says, because chances are, there's a whole lot of people there that don't know who Jesus is. So I'm on my way to see you, but I want you to do a few things really quick. In uh, uh, chapter 16, verse 2, he says, on the first day of each week, put aside a portion of the money you've earned. Don't wait till I get there and try to collect it all at once. Paul said, I need you to get together and have service on Sundays and take off. It's in a book. I just want to put that. It's in a book, right? Okay. It's in a book. It's in a book. Somebody, somebody asked me the other day, where in the Bible does it show that you give offerings on Sunday? I, I said, first of all, you can give whatever you want to give. But Paul said that on the first day of the week, I want you to set something aside. Okay, y'all got that, right? Y'all got that? Okay. Then he says in verse 10, he says, I want, when Timothy comes, don't intimidate him. He's doing the Lord's work just as I am. So Paul was setting order in the house, and he was also telling him to honor in the house. Paul says, I know I'm the apostle, but Timothy, my son, is coming first. And when Timothy gets there, I want you to honor him like you honor me. Why does that matter now? Because here, I want y'all to catch this revelation really quick, okay? Here, here it is. If someone else is up here preaching on a Sunday, and they don't happen to be me, we have an obligation to honor them as well. I'm just making sure we got it. Yep. Okay, all right. So he says, I need you to get these two things in order, and then I'm coming. Because I want to address the things that the church is dealing with. What is the church dealing with? The church of Corinth. Well, they were dealing with sexual morality. You had a man who uh, started sleeping with his father's wife in the church. They were dealing with abusing the communal meal. They were taking advantage of the Lord's Supper. This is why Paul said in, in, in Corinthians, if you're hungry, eat at home. Concerning communion, right? They weren't taking it with all severity and, and uh, seriousness. They, they were claiming to be spiritual, more spiritual than one another. You had super saints in the church. Yeah. People acting like, because I know one more scripture than you, then I actually have more Holy Ghost than you got. That, that was happening in the church, right? They were dealing with, they were dealing with um, uh, 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 suing one another in public courts. 
This is what Paul said, look, you don't have to go to a heathen judge who are believers. Y'all should be able to figure this thing out amongst each other, right? And then they had this sordid reputation, this bad reputation in the city of Corinth. And it's a word, and I'm, I, you know I, I struggle pronouncing Greek words, but it's a word called Corinthazamai. Corinthazamai was an insult. They meant to live immorally like a Corinthian. Other people around other cities refer to them as an immoral city. Man, it sounds like people, how they look at those eyes works. I was at the, at the gym about a week ago and I was talking to a gentleman that we met for the first time and we were talking. He says, I hear that you're a preacher. I said, yes, I am. He says, okay. He says, well, let's talk about this. And we were just going back and forth about scriptural concepts and, and the state of the world according to the Bible. And he says, wow, that's interesting. He says, I need to come see your church and, and come worship with you. He says, where's your church? I said, there's a hospital. He said, Y'all got online? Y'all go. <laughs> and so I looked at that, and I looked at this text and said, wow, that's interesting because the way neighboring cities look at the Corinth, that's how neighboring cities look at Desert Hot Springs. But the funny thing was, Paul said, in spite of the fact that there's a crazy reputation there, in spite of the fact that there's a negative connotation associated with that city, there's still a great opportunity there. And, if, and I'm sorry, if God is the same God yesterday, today, and then forever, if he can look at a bad city back then and say there's an opportunity there, surely he can look at a city now and say, wait, there's an opportunity there. And so verse 9, 1 Corinthians 16, he says, this is Paul writing, he says, there is a wide open door for a great work there, although many may oppose me. Paul says, I know that the city is messed up. I know that the church is all the way messed up. He says, but there's a great opportunity there, a, wide, a door wide open, although many may oppose me. Remember I told you, with revival comes persecution. With revival comes opposition. Everyone's not going to be happy that the church is waking up and being revived. And what do you mean the church is waking up? We've been having church all throughout the pandemic. Yes, we have, but the church has been walking dead. We've been walking sleep, sleepwalking. Because we've been getting up, getting dressed every Sunday, but we haven't seen no power. We haven't expected any miracles. We haven't seen any breakthroughs. We've just been going to church to check in on Facebook and say, I'm at church about to turn up real quick for Jesus. But we haven't done anything. And so now, Paul, now, now the enemy's saying, okay, this pandemic has actually worked for the good of the Lord. Because now the church is saying, wow, we've been having church all this time. And we still, what, what is going on? Bishop Noel Jones said, I got people in my church asking me and crying, saying, you brought in all these prophets in 2019. And they all took $100 from us. But nobody told us this COVID was coming. Now the church is working. Now the church is starting to see a lot of the things that we put a priority on really were not a priority because somewhere along the line between 2000, between the first century and now, we lost sight of souls. Yeah. So here, we're, 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 we're about to enter a revival. Wide open opportunity. A revival is an improvement in the condition or the strength of something. Improve of the strength of the church. Now, the good news for us is with revival comes restoration. With revival also comes recompense. Okay, all right. Okay. I'm going to help us real quick. It helps real quick. Restoration means that it restores something to its original state. With revival, the church gets restored to its original state. What's the original state of the church? Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit was poured out, they got so excited that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. And then from that point, they went from home to home, town to town, sharing the word, sharing the food. Nobody liked anything because we were a family. And when you need it and we had it, you had it to the point where you didn't have to leave the household of faith, the community of faith to get anything because we took care of each other. The Bible says that daily they went from the temple to their homes and they just fellowship. With revival comes restoration. But then also with revival comes recompense. That means to make amends for loss, to compensate. With revival after COVID, recompense is going to fall on the house of God. Meaning God is about to give some of us double for our trouble. 
Meaning, meaning God is about to restore some things to us that we lost during COVID. Some of us, some of us, some of us, some of us. And I saw something, uh, uh, Apostle Ralph Mason was preaching today, and I caught part of his message. The message was so good, I got to go back and watch it later. But he said, during the pandemic, and I can't think of the number exactly, but it was over 700,000 millionaires were birthed during right. the pandemic. you an entrepreneur, you ought to be excited right now because it's a great opportunity for you. Yeah. And I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe that, that, that people that love the Lord have to suffer during this pandemic. No different than what Job had to deal with during his own personal pandemic. He had to suffer and his wife was touched and his children were touched and his, his, his livelihood was touched and finances were touched. But because he endured that pandemic then, God then restored him double for his trouble. That's what the scripture says. And God says that after revival, here comes restoration, here comes recompense. I'm going to get some stuff back. <laughs> I'm going to get some. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't even speak for y'all, man. But I started meditating on this, and I got happy on the way here because there's some things that were taken from me during this whole pandemic that God has says that now that revival is coming, part of your reward will be recompense. I'm going to restore to you what the locust stole. I'm going to restore to you what COVID tried to take away. I'm going to bring back in abundance everything that the economy stole, everything the doctor tried to take. Recompense will fall on the house. Paul says, since you want to shout on revival, restoration, and recompense, yes. that means that you are a willing participant in the revival. Yes. Paul says, since you, because here's the thing, you can't have the promise without the process. Oh, yeah. uh, you can't get the reward without meeting the prerequisites. You can't graduate without doing all the classes, can you? I don't know, today, that's weird. But, but traditionally, right? And Paul says that I need you, church, to understand that this is coming to you, but it's not coming for you. It's coming for those that are coming from the revival. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be selfish, church. I'm restoring you, not so you can brag about how good you look and how great you feel, but so you can have strength to go out and get the souls and gather them in. Because COVID has beaten a lot of us up. COVID, the stress behind it. And some of us have slept well in over a year. He says, look, I'm going to give you rest and restore you. The root word to restoration is rest. I'm going to allow you to rest so you can be restored. Not so you can get up and brag about how great you feel, but so you can have a second wind to go out to those fields. Yeah. I'm going to give recompense. I'm going to give you double for your trouble. Not so you can buy the house that sits on top of the hill, but then you can feed all that you come across that are hungry because for the first time in a long time, you have more than enough for you and your house and everything. Anybody want to be that kind of blessing to where I have enough for me and my house and everybody else being that? And if I'm at the grocery store and I see a woman struggling with her car to pay for her groceries, I just say, you know what, put your car away. I'll just take care of you. When I see somebody staring at the produce section trying to decide what they can and cannot afford, well, I can just walk by and say, just go and get it in your basket, baby. I got it. God said, recompense is coming to the house, but not for you. I would tell you to slap your neighbor high five, but we can't. So just in your mind, slap your neighbor high five and say, it's on the way, 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 it's on the way. So he says, look, he says, I need you to do this. This is your strategy, church. I've given you this. I just need you to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Parents, you know how it is. You tell your children, I will give you all of this. I just need you to clean your room. I don't, I don't want you to do nothing else. You ain't got to pay no bills. You ain't got to go to work. You ain't got to do nothing. I will give you all of this. All I need you to do is clean it. That's all. And God is saying, I'm going to give you all of this. All I need you to do is this. Yes. It tells in comparison to what I'm going to do for you. He says, first thing is, I need you to be on guard. First yep. Corinthians 16, verse 13. This is where we are. He said, I need you to be on guard. Don't worry about the light. Satan, we got you too. Okay. He says, He says, first of all, uh, uh, y'all don't understand. I'll preach in the dark. This don't bother me. <laughs> Lights start going out. People, yeah, everybody, yeah, fine. Right, right, right. First Corinthians 16, 13, 13, he says, first, I want you to be on guard. First, first Peter 5 and 8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. 
He prowls around like a roaring lion. He's not a roaring lion. He's like one for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and strongly their faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering that you're going through. Okay, so I need us to understand two things here. Be on, somebody said, be on guard. Watch the enemy. Just watch him. Because he's crafty. But while he's picking on you, he's picking on the rest of the body as well. Part of being on guard means that you can't have pity parties because you're getting picked on. This is not the season for woe is me because everybody's going through. And as a matter of fact, some of us just carry it better than others. But if we ever had a bidding session at the church one night, you brought all your problems to the table. I guarantee you leave with your problems gladly by the time somebody else put all their problems on the table. The story, the, story, the story says I was frustrated. I was frustrated when I found out I didn't have gas in my car until I met a man that didn't have no shoes. So he says, be on guard because the enemy, right? He's in it. He's, he's crafty. He's looking for his people to devour. He says, but don't, 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 don't get frustrated because he's picking on you because he's picking on everybody. We all, we all get picked on. If you haven't picked on this week, raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, I need you to pray for all of us. Because we all get picked on. Something's going on in all of our lives every day. He says, so, so the whole household, all of us are getting messed up. So don't make it about you. We need to be here for each other. But then he said, but but then be but but be but 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 be 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 on guard. Be on guard. Paul said, let's not be ignorant of the enemy's devices. Y'all remember that second Corinthians? Now, what he was talking about was there was the man that had sexual immorality in the church. He was unrepentant in 1 Corinthians. So they had to put him out. He then repented and wanted to come back and be restored. Paul said, restore him unless you fall for the enemy's devices. I want y'all to be, okay. Be on guard. Here it is. You think Satan is showing up to the body with a pitchfork. And really, he's coming through with a grudge. We look at on Satan to come through burning candles and, and all that kind of stuff. And he's seeping through the body with unforgiveness. We wait on Satan to show his ugly self so we can get the oil and cast out a demon and roll him around the floor and open the door and tell the children to go out the room and Jesus, 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 yes, that's how we cast out demons. He says, but sometimes it's not even that serious. Sometimes you make it easy for me when you just won't let it go. I should probably pause right there before everybody walk out. Brother Rich said, I'll be here. Like, right, 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 right. In the Message Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, it reads this way. After all, he wants him to restore the man. We don't want to unwittingly give Satan an opening for yet more mischief. We're not oblivious to his sly ways. What Paul was saying is, if you allow a grudge to settle in the body, then you're giving Satan an opportunity to act a fool. Y'all know how it goes. What happens? And I'm just going to pick on him because he's, 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 a, he's a visitor. So I'm going to pick. I probably shouldn't pick on the visitor, but I'm backwards. So I'm just going to pick on him, right? Let's just say I have a problem with him. Hmm. He comes to repent and he tries to restore, but I'm going to hold on to the grudge. Uh, now, revival is coming. He said, I'm going to send them in. Yeah. Right? Y'all remember that? Okay, revival is yeah. coming. This is a great opportunity. Yeah. Revival is coming, but I got a problem with him. And so when the souls come in the church and they gravitate to him, not because of his charm, but because of his anointing, do you know that because of the oil in your life, you attract people? Yes. And what I attract may not be what you attract. He may attract, and then here's what you got. We have to respect the oil in our lives. You can reach people that I will never be able to reach. Right? And so now, because I have a grudge with him, and the souls are coming in, the first thing I'll do is get one of those souls. I wouldn't trust him if I was you. You remember the, uh, two years ago, he, he, I have a grudge. We think Satan's coming in the church in an oblivious way to act a fool. When in essence, he's here already. Because, and I'm not talking about here, I'm talking about the church is down the street. Not this one. But, right, right, right. but he's here already because we refuse to let grudges come. 
Part of being on guard is to stand firm. He told us to stand firm. He said to stand firm. Yeah. James 4 and 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee. The word resist means to withstand. It means to oppose. How do I, res how do I oppose the devil? With the word of God. When Satan tried to tempt Jesus three times, Jesus quoted Deuteronomy to him with the word of God. And after the third time, Satan left. Do you realize that the reason why Satan won't leave you alone is because you're saying everything except for the word of God? No. Satan is not afraid of your opinion. Satan's not afraid of our catchphrases. You can say, who going to check me, boo, all you want to. Satan ain't going nowhere. But it's with the word of God where he trembles. And so the issue is, many of us are dealing with Satan just because we don't know the word. I love y'all. Romans 16, 17, Paul says to mark those that cause division and avoid them. He's talking about those that are teaching doctrines that are contrary to the faith. The quickest way Satan can destroy the body of Christ is by allowing false teaching in the body. I have people that I grew up in the church with who no longer believe what I believe. They now are call themselves Hebrew Israelites. And they now teach that the Holy Spirit is a figment of our imagination. They teach that, you know, they do, they do. Yeah, they, they, they teach that hell is not a real place. Right? They teach that Deuteronomy, or they, they teach that Jeremiah 10 says that we can't have Christmas trees. And if you got a Christian, you go to hell. Oh, I love them, but I avoid them. Yes. Right. about being on guard, right? Why do I need to avoid them? Because if I spend too much time with you, then when I get to church and I hear the true living word, I'm going to start to question everything because it doesn't sound like what you told me. But what you told me is some stuff that somebody made up. They, 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 they gave you a new name with a bunch of words that you can't pronounce and told you something that's not really there and now I'm sitting in church questioning everything that I know to be true. I'm not picking on nobody. But I run into you and I say, hey, what's up, bro? My new name is Malaka Aka. Your name is Jerome. Stop. Yeah. <laughs> 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 now, I had to, to have me spitting on everybody during COVID. And stop all that. My name is Jerome. That's what your name is. I want you to be on guard. I want you to be strong and I want you to be courageous as well, he said. Remember in Joshua 1 when Joshua was told to be strong and courageous. Moses is dead. Now I want you to be strong and courageous because you're going to lead these people. Paul is saying I want you to be strong and courageous. One, because you're going to have to confront sin within the congregation. Before God allows revival to pour into the church, he's going to allow correction to sweep through the church. And whatever is not confronted will never be corrected. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you, you can't get deliverance where there is denial. That doesn't work that way. And so he said, you're going to have to be strong and courageous to correct sin in the church. Why? Because you might have to correct somebody that's your friend or that's your that's close right. one. And you might have to correct. Look, my wife and I, I love this woman. She loves me. But there's times that we have to correct each other. And it's not comfortable. But you got to be strong and courageous to combat it. Because the enemy will use familiarity yes. to keep you from calling out what needs to be called out. Yes. Oh, I'm teaching better than people are saying amen. And I'm okay with that. But whatever's not confronted will never be corrected. Yes. And so at the end of the day, you need to be strong and courageous. You need to remember who you are, right? And be strong and courageous. We have family members that are here. This is my sister. This is my blood sister. I love this girl. But y'all know that if she's out of pocket, I have to say something. Yes. Y'all yes. uh, with me? Yes. Okay. You need to be strong and courageous. But I can't do it, Mama Patterson, because I love them too much. Yes. And I don't want them to leave and go to another church right. if I correct them. This is why you're not called to do it. You're called to allow his spirit to do it. I'm trying to get away from this point. <laughs> but Zechariah said, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord. Which means that I need to be led by the spirit. Here's the reason why correction turns into a fight. Because you try to correct the flesh. Yes. Yes. Come on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Look, 
y'all done shouting already, so I'm about to say amen now. Y'all done dancing on you. I'm about to say amen. Yeah, yeah. Y'all done bucked and danced and went and fell out, all that kind of stuff, right? Right. We just gonna talk real in here. The reason why correction and when people come to me and they well, well they won't receive it, is it possible that they see flesh being led as opposed to the spirit? Yeah. Come on. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Revival is coming. Amen. And before God sends them in, he has to clean this out. Yes. yes. Okay, I'm gonna check. Okay. Yes. <laughs> What, my wife and I, before before we were we were blessed with Caleb, um, we figured we'd never have a child. So we thought that we were going to have to adopt, right? So we went through the adoption. We started the adoption process. They gave us a stack of papers this thick almost. Wow. Y'all, are y'all safe with me, wow. right? And in those papers was a background check, mm. FBI, yeah. employment, yeah. character references, all that kind of stuff. But then there was also a home inspection. They said, before we bring anything that's broken into your home, we want to make sure that your home is not broken. These children in the foster care system have been abused over and over again. We need to make sure that your home is on a place that's conducive to abuse. We don't, because at the end of the day, we don't want these children. If these children get hurt one more time, they, Y'all, y'all hear me? Yeah. And I can almost see God looking at the church saying, look, there's a great opportunity. Revival is coming. But before I allow the abused to come into the church, I need to make sure the church is no longer an abuser. Right. Come on. Amen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Why would God bring them manipulated into a place where they can be manipulated again? Why would God bring the broken into a place so they can be broken even further? Yes. yes. All in the name of the Lord. Wow. Come on. Come on. So, Lord, I need to be strong and courageous by your spirit. Because me and my flesh, I don't have the ability to minister to the broken people, maybe. Me and my spirit, I don't have the ability to love the unlovable. But it's not by my might, it's not by my power, but it's by your spirit. And if I lead through your spirit, Ephesians 3.20 says this, that he will be, he will, uh, uh, he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to his spirit. Which means that by his spirit, I can embrace those that can't really be loved. By his spirit. Do y'all know? Do y'all know? Now, now, I like what I see here today. This is pretty much what I like. We're, 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 we're kind of like a boiling pot. You get black, you get some white, you get some Hispanic and all that kind of stuff. Do you know that there's going to be a time where God sends the racists and bigots in the church? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We want God to do miracles. We all do send the miracles and wonders, signs, miracles and wonders. And we think it just means lay hands on somebody and they get out of the wheelchair and start walking. That is a sign, miracle and wonder. But you know what's even beyond that? A bigot walking in the church saying, I no longer am a racist. I just serve Jesus and I see us all as brothers and sisters in Christ. Right, right. But we can't ask God to send the bigots in church when we have bigoted views ourselves. Because all we're going to do is reinforce their bigoted views. And so now God sends them in the church and they get a, they get a taste of this bigotry in, not this church, the church down the street, not this one. They get a, they get a taste of the church down the street and then the, then, the, then the bishop, not me, another bishop, gets up to preach and he's looking at Crayola box sections. Black, white, green. No, that's not how it works. I'm done with this. Paul charged us to stand guard. I put some picture of our, how old is Bosco, 70? We have a 70 year old Rock Shepherd mix. He's old. And he was standing in front of the door. And I took a picture, I said, he still watches the house. And he still does, he still got a little fight in him, right? And stand guard literally means to guard the house, hold the faith. But guarding the household of faith does not just mean protecting it from what's going to come in from the outside. It means protecting the valuables inside as well. When we leave the house, we turn on our alarm. And our alarm and our cameras, they watch the outside so there's no external breach. 
But then there's motion sensors to make sure the inside is right as well. God is saying, I want you to stand guard. Don't just police the world, police the church as well. When there's something out of pocket in the church, call it out. And it's funny how we can see sin everywhere else but in the pews. Y'all you know, you know, notice that, right? We can see sin everywhere else, but right, right not in the pews down the street. Not here, but over there, right? Because we ain't got that little, yeah, right. <laughs> for those who think I'm, I'm, I'm being serious, trust me, I tell everybody, if you're looking for a perfect church, do not come here. Don't, don't go anywhere. Just go somewhere else. If you're looking for a perfect bishop, I will find you one, but I'm not the one, okay? So I'm just joking when I say not here. But, but we can find sin and we want to rebuke sin and we want to bind sin and we want to, we want to cast a demon out the White House and the demon said, get the demon out of God's house first, then come talk to me. He said, I want you to stand guard, I want you to be strong, I want you to be courageous. I want you to move by my spirit. But then here's the final thing, and I love how Paul wrapped this up this way, for the zealous super saints that want to take the first three instructions and go beat everybody upside the head. Now look, now look, before we get to this fourth one, understand this. Jesus said that you can't remove a speck out of somebody's eye when you got a demon in your own. Right? So let's not take this text and use it to be judgmental. I see sin, I'm going to call it out because trust me, as you judge, Jesus said that that same level of judgment will be come back on you. So be careful going through people's Facebook trying to judge them when they're going through your book and they can judge you too. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? Quick story. Okay. Come on. Right. Had a situation where somebody attended the church before, and they said, I was on so and so's Facebook, and they were at the club. I don't think they should be at the club and it'd be a church. I said, Well, this is exactly where they need to be. There's a club last night, they need to be in church now. But how do you know they was at the club? Either you were at the club with them, or you laid in your bed watching them, which is even worse. Well, I'm just saying, got you. right there, right? So before we want to put on our hats of judgment, understand this, that we all have fingers that can be pointed back at us as well. This is why he says, do it according to the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God will let you do it in a way where it won't look like you're condemning anybody. You're just trying to put somebody back on the right track, okay? All right. Paul says he ends up this way. He says, do it all in love, right? Be strong, stand firm, all that, but do it all in love. First Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. First Corinthians 12 is the gifts chapter. Paul in first Corinthians 12 lines out all these gifts that are available to the body of Christ. He said that we all have them. First Corinthians 13, he says, now, you've got to understand, with the New Testament writings, they weren't chapters, they were letters. So if you do, like, chapter 11, turn the page, we put it in chapters, but he was really just turning the page in the letter. So chapter 12, he writes, oh, these are all the gifts. We're many parts, one body, doesn't matter if you have a big gift or a small gift, every gift is important. I'm out of room, let me turn the page. But all these gifts mean nothing if you don't have love one for another. He said, I can have every gift. I can speak with the tongues of angels, but if I don't have love, I'm just making a bunch of noise. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love, y'all know the scripture, right? And then he turns the page and he goes to chapter 14 and he says this, let your love be your highest goal. Y'all catch that? So my, 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 my goal is to act as a servant of God to get his house prepared for the revival that's coming. But even beyond my goal, I should have a desire to show love to everyone. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Because why should love be my highest goal? Because God is going to send people in this building. Well, not this one, that one. Okay. He'll send people to the body that we just don't like. There's some people that we don't agree with. People that get on our nerves. Let me flip it around. He's going to send people here that say you get on their nerves now. Yes. Right. Yes. How can we function when we don't like each other? Yes. Well, if love is our highest goal, we have an opportunity to do that. Yes. That don't make no sense. Well, yes, it does. Because how many times have you sat at your family table at Thanksgiving knowing you can't stand your sister? <laughs> well, because 
because love is your highest goal, you pass her the macaroni and cheese. I'm the only one with a dysfunctional family, it's just me. Y'all forget, I know some of y'all families. Don't, don't, don't be that, don't do that. Don't do that, don't do that. Right, right, right. Don't do that, I know some of y'all families, okay. All right. So, <laughs> what does this love look like as I close? Love does, this love does two things. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He so loved that he gave. Love gives. Love gives. Love may say, you're new, but I'm going to slide over and give you my seat. Love will say, I know I've been, let me pick one something that's not here. I know I've been a harmonica player for nine years, but you're more gifted than I am at harmonica. So I'm going to give you my microphone. Y'all, y'all with me? Love gives. Love gives. The end of the word forgive is give. Which means that I'm giving you an opportunity at reconciliation by foregoing the apology. Forgive. Y'all with me? For means forego. Give means accept. Love gives. Which means that you may have stepped on my toe last year, but I forgive you. I don't even need an apology because love is my highest goal. But then secondly, what does this love look like? Romans 5 and 8 says, God showed his love to us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Love dies. Love dies. Love says that because love is my highest goal, I died to myself so that you can be comfortable. I died to myself. Are y'all with me? Yeah. That's nothing but marriage every day. Marriage every day, you have to die. Amen. If you don't die, then somebody gonna fight. Yeah. <laughs> And my wife got heads, so I'm not, I'm just, I'm just gonna die. I'm just gonna die. Listen, I just wanted to encourage us this morning because there's a great opportunity, as Paul said. And this opportunity is revival is coming. And if revival comes, we're gonna have to be strong, firm, courageous. We're gonna have to be able to call out sin the way it is in the house, but do it in love, led by His Spirit. But the reward is great. The reward is revival, restoration, and recompense. And I'm excited. So I'm going to do what it takes to get us there. Anybody with me over there? Amen. Amen. You may not know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to do that. If you're not saved on today, today is your day. What does being saved mean? Well, that means that Jesus left this earth going to prepare a place for us. John 13, 14. And when he, he said, I'm coming back to get my church. Now, there's another place that's being prepared as well. The Bible says hell is enlarging itself. So there's heaven and then there's hell. One place is eternal life. Other place is eternal damnation where there's weeping, burning, gnashing of the teeth. If Jesus was to come back within the next three minutes, as Paul said in Thessalonians, a trumpet sounds. When you open your eyes, do you know that you'll be with him for sure? If you're not sure, you need to get saved. If you're at home watching on Facebook Live, if you're not sure, you need to be saved. And the greatest thing about salvation is you don't have to be in a church to get it. You can get it right where you are. I got saved for real in the bathroom of my house when I was having suicidal thoughts. I wasn't at the front pew, I was in my house. So if that's you on Facebook, comment below in says we will call you and walk you through that prayer. Is there anybody in the house that needs to get saved on today? Everybody saved. I'm saved. Everybody saved. Amen. Everybody is saved. We're going to prepare for communion as Mr. Tommy comes and the church mothers come. Amen. at home, go ahead and prepare them. We're going to say the Bible, and we're going to share at the Lord's table. The Bible tells the story of Jesus sitting at the table known as the Last Supper. And 
he knew that it was time. And the Bible says that he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken unto you. This is a prophetic statement concerning the beating that his body would take. And then he took the wine and he says, look, this wine is symbolic. He's let them know the wine was symbolic of the new covenant. Meaning that once his blood was shed on the cross, once his blood was shed on Calvary, we now be made right with God for all that who believe. This is key here because it's the blood that washes us. You have to understand in the Old Testament that when someone sinned, they brought an animal on the Day of Atonement and an animal was slain at the altar. And on that particular day, if the priest was holy, they can now get right with God. But Jesus said that you don't have to wait till the Day of Atonement. You just have to believe on me on the cross. Ooh, it ain't, ain't oh man, anybody glad about that? But then something happened on the cross, and it's another reason why we, we, we celebrate at the Lord's table. Matthew's gospel records that when he gave up the ghost and said it was finished, there was a great earthquake that happened, and there was a veil in the temple, and that veil in the temple is what separated me from the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies is where I can go and sit at the feet of God. And then only the priest could go there. So if this was if this was today, only I could go to the Holy of Holies. You'd have to come to me with your sins and with your sin offerings, and I go to the Holy of Holies. The problem was, what if I wasn't right? The Bible says that they tied a bell around the leg of the priest. And as the priest walked into the Holy of Holies, the bell was to let people know that he was still alive when he got into the presence of God. Could you imagine waiting all year to get your sins forgiven? Give your sin offering to a priest and he goes into the temple and the bell stopped ringing. But when the bell was ringing too, we now, us, were given access to the throne of grace. Which means that we no longer have to wait for a priest to take us in there. So we celebrate at the Lord's table because of the blood and because of access on today. Anybody grateful to know that I don't have to wait on nobody, I don't have to wait for Sunday morning, I don't have to call the bishop, I don't have to call anybody. When I need Jesus, I can go directly to the throne of grace all by myself. So on today, you're going to be escorted up by section. We're going to ask you to take one from the tray and go back to your seat. When you get there, we're going to open and commune together, all right? Um, who's, oh, okay, there you go.
Wash away my sins. <laughs> what can make me whole again? <laughs> Drink ye all of it. You all, we're going to close out with, I know it was the blood, but let me say this. Two things, three things. One, if you have a gift to give, you can give it online. Um, Mr. Tara will be in the back with the baskets. And you can drop your gifts off back there too. Men, if you need a place to watch the game, we're going to watch the Super Bowl back here. Um, we'll be here at 2:30. Uh, it'll be. We'll have it on the projector. We'll be socially distant, um, and we're making sure that um, we're making sure that everything is done according to public protocols. But if you just don't want to watch the game alone, you don't have to. You can be back there with us, okay? And then finally, um, Brother Carl Baker sitting on the other organ. You all, this is, this this organ is a traditional chai and pipe organ that was here when the Lutherans built the church. He is um, uh, a musician that plays that organ and he'll be coming to hang with us a little while. Uh, him and Minister David will be in communication towards the end of service when we start to um, flow into moments of prayer. We'll be singing older hymns and he's gonna get bless us with his gift. Right, so can we praise God for the rain? Brother Sarge, you got a birthday tomorrow. We normally don't do this, but 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 I know the testimony and I just want to celebrate on today. So can we sing happy birthday to Brother Sarge? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless you. Sopranos, I can't hear y'all. session.